Praise God. It's good to share the word again. I've not been around for a while, but uh, for five services, I'll be speaking on this subject. Initially, I've entitled it Developing a Christian Worldview, but I decided the word Christian sometimes uh, can connote different meaning uh, for different people with different traditions. So i rather call it Developing a Biblical Worldview, a worldview that's grounded in the Word of God. So I'm going to read one verse of Scripture. We're going to pray. We're going to ask God to open our hearts, soften our spirit so that we can receive His Word, so that our minds will be challenged, our hearts will be touched, our spirit will be uh, enlivened to really live for the Lord. So the Word of God says in John chapter 8, verse 31 and 32, Then Jesus said to the Jews who believe Him, If you abide in My Word... You are my disciples indeed, and you will know the truth, and the truth will set you free. Let's pray that God is going to set us free today. Let's bow for a word of prayer. Father in heaven, we come humbly before you. We recognize that as we think of the greatness of God yourself, it confounds us. But we ask that, Lord, there will be a revelation of your truth. In Jesus' name, we break the deception of the devil that wants to bring our minds into captivity so that we lose that vibrancy of walking with God and knowing God in a very personal way that will totally change our lives from within. I just pray in Jesus' name that your presence, your spirit of truth will be right here to release that truth beyond just our understanding into our very innermost being. And Lord, I pray that if there be someone here searching for you, your word says that whosoever seek will find, that this will be the day of salvation for them. So we thank you, Lord, in Jesus' name. Amen. A story was told about an old man that was walking through a park. He had with him a huge sag of peanuts. And as he walked through the park, He was picking these peanuts and throwing it all around him, in front, behind, on his left, uh, on his right. And so after a while, the whole park was filled with all these peanuts on on the ground. A policeman came up to him and said, Sir, what are you doing? Why are you littering this beautiful garden? Whereupon he said, I do this to get rid of the elephants. The police was confounded. What elephants? There are no elephants here. Haha, I told you so. It works, doesn't it? <laughs> this is how many people think of Christians today. Sometimes they see us as a demented old man who created a God who really doesn't exist created some make believe demons or devils that don't exist. And we do our spiritual mumbo-jumbo every weekend. And then we look around and everything seems calm and fine. And we say, you see, God is not punishing us. The devil don't seem to be showing up. You see, it works. In other words, the world often sees us as a group of people who blindly believe in a religious book or tradition. And God becomes an easy answer to whatever that goes right or wrong in our lives, just like this man in the park. And what's worse is this, that sometimes I discover that even many so-called Christians think this way. You see, many of us don't really believe in our innermost being what the Bible says. So we give simplistic answers like, oh, just take it by faith. Have you ever been told by people, just believe in the Bible that it's true because the Bible says it's true. And you walk away saying, that sounds like a circular argument. Cannot somebody give me a reason of the faith so that not only do we understand it as just a statement of faith, but we believe that it is logical and it makes sense so that there is a deep conviction in our heart. Otherwise, we become spiritual schizophrenics who put some religious jargon in the church. We come in and say, hallelujah, praise the Lord. But deep in our heart, we don't really believe it. And when we go into the world, we 
leave behind our religious cap outside the door and we go back and take on a Christian, a non-Christian mindset and operate as if we don't believe that God exists. Our faith has no impact in the way we think as a businessman or as a lawyer or as a teacher. I'm going to take five messages to talk about developing a biblical worldview that will undergird our whole life from the way we feel to the way we think to the way we act. Now, out of the five weeks, I'll be away for... Actually, I'm away every week in between and come back and preach, but there's one weekend that I cannot make it. So after two messages, I take a break and someone else will minister uh, a message to all of us and I come back to complete the last of the three uh, messages. But I'm helping... I want us to build our faith not only on solid biblical foundation, but be able to think from the perspective of God and develop a worldview that makes sense for ourselves so that we walk with conviction. And when we do that, our whole Christian life becomes more integrated. We don't separate our mind from our heart. Uh, we think, we understand the logic of it, and yet we are able to take a step of faith to know a God who is far beyond our understanding, who can do exceeding abundantly beyond what we could even ask or think. And as we do that, not only are we be able to walk an integrated Christian life, we will be able to make a defense to everyone who asks us for a reason, for the hope that is in you, which is in found in 1 Peter chapter 3, verse 15. Sanctify the Lord in your heart and always be ready to give a defense to everyone who asks you a reason for the hope that is in you, not as a holier-than-thou attitude, but with a spirit of humility, meekness, and fear, knowing that we are the result of God's love and compassion and grace. But before I go on, let's ask ourselves the question, what is a worldview? A worldview is the theory of the world used for living in this world. A worldview is a mental model of reality, a framework of ideas and attitudes about the world, about ourselves, about our lives. In other words, your worldview is what you really believe as reality in every aspect of your life in such a way that it affects the way you live, it shapes the whole direction and the purpose of your life. Dr. Carol Hill, head of the social at the School of Interdisciplinary Studies from Glasgow University said, by worldview, I mean the basic way of interpreting things and events that pervades a culture so thoroughly that it becomes a culture's concept of reality. What is good, what is important, what is sacred, what is real, it extends to perception of time and space, of happiness and well-being. The beliefs, values and behaviour of the culture stem directly from its worldview. We've got different worldview today. But worldview is what we perceive as real. And if that's our worldview, that's how we live on the basis of what we understand as being real. It was Dr. Ravi Zacharias, by the way, sign up for Momentum, he's one of our speakers. Recognised as one of the top Christian thinkers and apologists who said, a worldview has to do with four most fundamental issues. Number one, it has to do with origin. Number two, it has to do with meaning. Number three, it has to do with morality. And number four, it has to do with destiny. That's why it's so important what your worldview is, because every one of us has one. And I'm just hoping that your worldview is indeed a biblical worldview that determines your understanding of origin, meaning, morality, and destiny. But in today's message, in our first introductory message, I would simply like to answer the question, why must we develop a clear and strong biblical worldview? Why is it so important that we spent five messages to talk about the development 
of a biblical worldview. I want to give you three reasons so that as you walk away, you will prepare your heart and ask God to shape your mind so that you will walk away from this few weeks saying, Lord, I want my worldview to be totally in line with the purposes and the truth that is revealed in Scripture. So reason number one, we need to develop a biblical worldview because a biblical worldview declares God's truth. It has to do with God's revealed truth. And the practical action word for us in this is that if this is true, we got to study God's Word in the light of every aspect of our life and give ourselves to the pursuit of truth in the studying of God's Word. A biblical worldview declares God's truth. Now let me ask you a question. Why did Jesus Christ come to the earth? Why? Boy, I'm in trouble. You can't answer this question. <laughs> I fail as a pastor. Why do you think Jesus came to earth? Excuse me? To save us. What, what did he do to save us? He died on the cross for us so that our sins will be paid, so that when that barrier of sin has been removed, we can have a relationship with God. I submit to you that there's only one side of the coin, only one aspect of the purpose of God's visit to earth in the person of Jesus Christ. You see, in John chapter 1, verse 17, it says, For the law was given through Moses, but grace and truth came through Jesus Christ. Remember, it's grace and truth. Grace is what Jesus did on the cross for us, taking our place so that we don't have to die an eternal death because He has taken the sins of the world on Himself. That's grace. Truth is that Jesus has come to give us a correct worldview of our origin, of our meaning, of our morality, and of our destiny. Remember when Jesus was brought before Pontius Pilate in his trial that led to his crucifixion? Pontius Pilate asked Jesus in John chapter 18, verse 37 and 38, Are you a king then? And Jesus answered, You say, you say rightly that I am a king. For this cause I was born. And for this cause I have come into the world that I should witness to the truth. Everyone who is of the truth, hears my voice. And Pilate, in his skeptical manner, threw out his arm and said, but what is truth? But remember, Jesus said, this is the purpose for which I come, that I bear testimony to truth. In the gospel, Jesus said at least 65 times in the gospel, I tell you the truth. 25 times in the gospel, Jesus said, Truly, truly, I say to you. We read in the verse just now in John chapter 8, verse 32, and you shall know the truth, and the truth will set you free. If you say you are a Christian, but you don't have a Christian biblical mindset, there is a tension within you, and that's why you find yourself becoming an emotional or spiritual schizophrenic, because you act differently under different circumstances. There's a, not a sense of integrity and integration of your understanding of what truth is. That's why Jesus said to his disciples, I am the way, the truth and the life. And when Jesus was preparing the disciples for his going away because he'll be crucified, he assured them that I will not leave you as often. I'm going to send you somebody to help you. And John 16 verse 13 says, and when the spirit of truth come, he will guide you into all truth. The apostle Paul in 1 Timothy 2, verses 3 to 4 says, This is good and pleases God, our Savior, who wants all men to be saved and come to the knowledge of the truth. This is the truth that sets us free. Not only that Jesus died for our sins 
And then we get saved and we go to heaven when we die, when we give our life to him. Yes, our Christian faith begins with that. But this truth Jesus is talking about is about this biblical worldview that would cause the truth of Scripture to affect every aspect of our life. In the area of arts and entertainment, in the area of business, science and technology, in the area of communications and media, in the area of even divine institutions and religion, in the area of education and school, in the area of family and home, in the area of government and leadership. You see, it's important that we spend our life pursuing and studying the Word of God so that we understand the truth of God as it relates to every sector of our living. And in this way, we will know the truth. And this biblical worldview that God has given so that we will be set free and live out the reality of God even when you go back to the office as a banker, as a lawyer, as a teacher, as a professional, as a worker. You know, the Western nation traditionally have become great nation because their nation was grounded in a biblical worldview. They have lost it since then, and that's why they are on a downward spiral. But our nation and the nation of Asia can become great nation when we begin to embrace not only Jesus Christ as Savior, but begin to walk and study and understand the truth of God as Jesus has revealed so that you impact every area, the public square, every area, and then the nation will become big and great and prosperous as well. So therefore, the challenge for us is to study. Put on your thinking cap and study. 2 Timothy 2.15 says, Study and be eager to do your utmost to present yourself to God approved, tested by trial, a workman who has no cause to be ashamed, correctly analyzing and accurately dividing or rather rightly handling and skillfully teaching the Word of God. The Bible has so much to say in almost every area of life, in your finances, in your marriage, how to overcome stress, every area. How do you do business? And the Bible says that His plan for us is to prosper us. So guys, study. One of the first applications is sign up for Momentum Conference. May the 1st, Ravi Zechariah will be there. Dr. Cao Xiao from China will be there to talk about the Christian mindset for, for China and our faith to believe that China will be a great nation when it become, when we make Christianity the very fabric of a society. Come and join us. Come, sign up for Faith Community Bible School. Uh, not community, yeah, Faith Community Bible School, okay? That's correct. Wake up. Give yourself two months or four months. Sometimes some of you can take off from work Begin, depending on your station in life, or maybe some of you are waiting to go to school, take off those times. Allow us to challenge you so that you understand systematic theology, what the Bible says. You understand how the Bible can be so applicable in our daily life, even in understanding objections against our faith, and yet God has an answer in His Holy Word. And these five weeks, Ask God to give you a sense of pursuing, uh, not pursuing, but pursuit of faith, of truth, of the knowledge of Scripture. I trust that the Spirit of God will put a hunger within you that you want to know more. You read more, not just the Bible, but every other kind of literature and be able to think through how the Word of God is so true and so applicable in those areas of our life. So that's the first reason why you and I must ask God to give us a biblical worldview because number one, a biblical worldview declares God's truth. And our application is study. Tell the guy next to you, study. <laughs> Tell the guy next to you, don't be lazy. There's a second reason why we got to develop a biblical worldview that only could come not only through study, but through the Spirit of God, opening our eyes to understand the truth of God. The first is that a biblical worldview declares God's truth. 
The second reason is that a biblical worldview deposes the devil's deception. It exposes and destroys. That's what it means to depose. It exposes and destroys the deception of the evil one. And only truth can defeat deception. Especially deception contained even within the Christian religion itself. You know, if you people who are expert to try to identify counterfeit bill, they don't spend all their time studying all the possible counterfeit bill because there will never be, uh, it will be endless. You know what? You study what a real bill looks like. Every nook, every corner, every stroke, you know it. So that when you pick up a counterfeit, you recognize it because you know what is the real thing. And so that's why we need to study and have a biblical worldview because we need to be able to expose falsehood, deception that the world brings around us, even creeping into the church that don't belong to the Bible, but just because it's accepted. This is what Jesus did in John chapter 8, verse 39 to 47. We see Jesus doing that to Judaism which is a faith originated from God through Abraham, but has been corrupted by the deception of the devil. And Jesus came to reveal the truth. And look at how direct he is in doing that, in confronting deception. In John chapter 8, verse 39 to 47, they answered, the Pharisees, the religious leader, hearing him preach, and said to him, Abraham is our father. Jesus said to them, if you were Abraham's children, you would do the works of Abraham. And now you seek to kill me, a man who has told you the truth which I heard from God. Abraham did not do this. You do the deeds of your father. Hear what he's saying. Abraham didn't do this. You're doing something else. You're actually doing the deed of your father. And straight away the Pharisee said, We were born not of fornication. We have one father, God. And Jesus said to them, If God were your father, you would love me. For I proceeded forth and came from God. Nor have I come of myself, but he sent me. Why do you not understand my speech? Because you are not able to listen to my word. You are of your father, the devil. Talk about being politically incorrect. Understand that he's talking to one of the highest level of, of religious leadership that has political power in the land, but who shrouded themselves saying that we are the sons of Abraham. And of all the religious sect, the most popular of which were the Pharisees because they are really zealous about the law. And Jesus looked piercingly into their eyes and said, let me tell you what God says about you. Your father is not God. Your father is the devil. You are of your father the devil and the desires of your father you want to do. He was a murderer from the beginning and does not stand in the truth because there's no truth in him. When he speaks a lie, he speaks from his own resources for he's a liar and the father of it. But because I tell the truth, you do not believe me. Which of you convicts me of sin? And if I tell the truth, why do you not believe me? He who is of God hears God's word. Therefore, you do not hear because you are not of God. Jesus was saying that you all have missed the truth of God. Your father is not Abraham, but the devil. I want to tell you this, that the same kind of deception can and has creep into the church in which we think that we're thinking Christianly, but we're not. We are bought into the lies of the deception of the devil from the world outside and we have brought it into our faith and we cannot really find freedom because some of us don't really know the truth and therefore the truth cannot set us free. That's why Paul in 2 Timothy chapter 4 verses 3 to 4 says, Preach the word. Be ready in season and out of season. In other words, popular or unpopular. Convince. Rebuke. Nowadays, I know of many, I, I tell you, I can grow this church by three times the size by changing my messages. 
But there are pastors who would not rebuke because that's not politically correct. And he doesn't bring in the crowd. But by, the Bible says, convince, rebuke, exhort with all long suffering and teaching. For the time has come when they, who are they? These are not the non Christian, they're the so called Christians in the church, will not endure sound doctrine, but according to their own desires, because they have itching years, they will heap up for themselves teachers, they will turn their years away from truth and be turned aside to fables. There are people who go to a church, hear the Word of God being taught, and his heart is convicted of sin, but he doesn't want to deal with it. You know what they do? They change church and go to a church that will say, it's okay. It's covered by the blood of Jesus. Don't feel condemned. When the Bible says we, got to be, we are not to be condemned, we are to be convicted of our sin. Paul, in his last speech, to the church of the to the elders of the church in Ephesus, because he knew that he was going to Jerusalem and he will be he will be uh, put in jail and he will never see them again. So he gave his farewell speech with tears to these precious elders and to this church with whom he has spent many years pastoring and helping. And he said, "I know that after I leave, savage wolves will come in among you and will not spare the flock." Even from your own number, men will arise and distort the truth. Men that is among you, your cell leader, maybe your pastor or your, your fellow members, they will rise up and distort the truth in order to draw away disciples after them. So be on your guard. Remember, for three years, I never stop. I lost my page. Remember, for three years, I never stopped warning each of you night and days with tears. Colossians chapter 2, verse 8. The Apostle Paul warns all of us, Beware lest anyone cheat you through philosophy and empty deceit, according to the tradition of man, according to the basic principle of the world, and not according to Christ. You see, the Bible tells us that there's a cosmic battle between God and the devil. Between God's truth and the devil's deception. Jesus said, the devil is a liar from the beginning. And so these Pharisees really think that they are living in God's truth. They have the whole tradition, but they've deviated it. They've been corrupting it. They've been explaining away the truth of God. They're not willing to face up with their sin. And they still think that their father is, is, is God. And Jesus said, your father is not God. Your father is S-A-Tan. And so it's crucial that we Christians develop a worldview because we want to depose the deception of the evil one that is out there, that is deceiving us all the time and deceiving especially our children. So right now, in this point, talking about devil's deception, I will bring much more details in the coming messages about science and about cosmology, about biology, about the whole aspect of morality. But I want to surface just two major deception that somehow permeate the thinking of the late 20th century into the present time. The first deception is what is known as postmodernism. Never mind about the word. If you don't, if you have heard of that, fine. You have not heard of that, that's fine. It doesn't matter. But this has infiltrated into the thinking of almost, almost everyone. Without going into the details about what postmodernism is, basically, postmodernism believes that there is no absolute. Nothing is absolute. Everything is okay. I want to tell you this this is the undergirding philosophy that is in most of the books that you read about worldview that, look, Nothing is fixed. Don't be so dogmatic. Nothing is absolute. Actually, there is a basic contradiction in this. 
It was John Nanox, the professor of mathematics at Oxford University, who said, at the heart of postmodernism lies a patent self-contradiction. It expects us to accept as absolute truth that there are no absolute truth. I remember years ago, I, and this is not new actually, it's just uh, that nowadays they call it new atheism because, uh, but there's nothing new in new atheism, it's just old atheism packaged in a different way so that they can sell more books and uh, give more seminars. But, uh, but it's the whole thing. In fact, years ago, I remember witnessing to one of my uncles about Jesus Christ. I was in my teenage years filled with zest and still filled with zest today, telling that Jesus is the only way. Uh, uncle, you must believe in Jesus. And this uncle, I mean, looking at me just uh, like a teenager, and my uncle said to me, Hong Zai, I'm called Hong Zai, you know, Kong King Hood, Hong Zai. Hong Zai, don't be so dogmatic. In this world, there are no absolute. I was very young, but I guess God gave me a spirit of wisdom. I turned around and said, Uncle, what you have said is the most absolute statement I've ever heard. You insist absolutely that in this world there are no absolute. But however, this thinking has infiltrated in many of our thinking. You go out there, they say, it doesn't matter. It's up to you. Believe what you want to believe. If you believe it, if you believe, then it's true. If you don't believe, it is not true. That's postmodernism. You know what? If something is true, it is true whether you believe it or not. I can say, I absolutely do not believe in the power of gravity. So try walking off a 13th story of a building. It doesn't matter how you believe. You can, before that, just, I believe, I believe, I believe, I believe. What's the result? You'll be jumping to your own conclusion. I see this rearing its head all the time. I remember when I first started speaking out against the wrong of homosexualism. Now, I want to always preface this. I have friends who are homosexuals. I never fight with them. I have always shown my concern, my friendship. I always reach out to them. Even nowadays, they get angry at me. I still smile at them and say hi. And I do that because the Bible says that's what we have to do. All right? But... That doesn't mean I have to agree with you. That doesn't mean that I cannot expose what I believe is wrong. The concept of homosexualism is not right. It's not natural. It's damaging to the society. I don't want to get into that today. But especially when you want to redefine what marriage is, it's going to mess up the whole society. But you know what? We hear voices, especially from the next generation, even within the church, that says, Yeah, Pastor, why you come across so hard, huh? You know, don't come out so judgmental. Don't the Bible says, judge not that you be not judged? I tell you, this is one of the most misused verse and misunderstood verse in the New Testament, especially in our age of tolerance. I just heard it being used in Fox News when the Pope spoke out against Donald Trump. I, would, I watch Fox News because the... U.S. election is so entertaining. <laughs> it's fun to watch, you know. And, and when the Pope spoke out against Donald Trump, all the Fox News caster came up and said, how can the Pope say this? How can the Pope challenge someone, one person of faith? After all, don't the Bible say, judge not that you be not judged? I tell you, this comes from smart people. I mean, the American newscasters, they're all very intellectually smart. They are very good people, okay? Highly intelligent, highly educated, have, have great degrees. They are lawyers. They are, are great academ academicians and, and great people, all right? So, this is misunderstood. We use this verse to mean, don't judge. Judge not that you be not judged. So today, let's deal with this deception, Actually, which is postmodernism rearing its head because the basic of it is that there are no basis for judgment. Don't judge people. 
But let me come back to this verse and let me share with you what is judgment. Matthew 7, it appears in Matthew 7 verse 1. But let's read the whole passage so that we understand the background. Matthew 7, 1 says, Do not judge or you too will be judged. For in the same way you judge others, you will be judged. And with the measure you use, it will be measured to you. So he said, be careful, don't judge. Because the standard you use to judge people, it will be used to judge against you. So don't judge. But look, don't stop there. Look at the next verse. Why do you look at the speck of sawdust in your brother's eyes and pay no attention to the plank that is in your own eyes? Can you imagine in your own eye, there's a whole plank, you know, there's this whole plank inside there. <laughs> and you don't see it, and all you do is you see the, the speck in somebody's eyes. You hypocrite. Can, can, you, can you get rid of this first? First of all, if you get rid of this, you can see clearer. And for goodness sake, even if you see somebody's speck in the eye, don't try to remove it with a pang in your eye. You might just gorge out his eyes. So this is what the Word of God is basically saying. So what does he say? Don't judge. No. Read on. Let me take the speck out of your eye when all the time... Uh, all the time there is a plank in your own eye. You hypocrite, first take the plank out of your own eye, then you will see clearly to remove the speck from your brother's eye. He's not saying don't judge. He's saying don't judge when you are blinded yourself. Clear up your vision. Judge yourself first. Make sure you have the right attitude and then you are clear. Then you are able to help others and judge others. And then he makes a judgment because he's coming against the religious leaders who are telling you don't judge, we judge. And he said, do not give dogs what is sacred. Do not throw your purse to the swine. If you do, they may trample them under their feet and then turn and tear you to pieces. He said, don't even try to remove those specks. Make a judgment about who they are, their heart first. No point when, if their heart is wrong. You know why? They are dogs. They are swine. Boy, you talk about politically incorrectness. Jesus is the champion. <laughs> he does not mince his words. He says, I don't even bother because it doesn't matter. Because they will never appreciate it. Don't cast what is sacred to the dogs and to the swine. And dog and pig are some of the lowest considered as some of the most defiled animal in the Jewish thinking. Jesus is not saying we should not judge. He's saying that you must first judge yourself. You see, my friend, life is a series of judgment. We make judgment all the time, don't we? When you cross the road, you judge whether a car is coming. Every day you make judgment as to whom you can trust, what job you should take, whom you should employ. Every day is judgment. I, as your senior pastor, I am paid to make judgment, you understand? I have to judge who will be a good cell leader that I can trust because I'm trusting him with lives. I have to judge who will be a good team pastor. And if I say, I don't want to judge, come on, they... It comes from this whole idea of post-modernistic thinking that says we should never judge. That's not true. John chapter 18 verse 30, uh, sorry, uh, John chapter 7 verse 24 says, Do not judge according to appearance, but judge with righteous judgment. Judge with righteous judgment. Remember when Jesus answered the words of Pontius Pilate about who he is? He said, for this reason I was born, for this I came into the world to testify to the truth. Everyone on the side of truth listens to me. Listen, there are sides. Truth is ruthlessly and dogmatically exclusive. It is never inclusive. It does not play well in this tolerant world, I know, but that's the very nature of truth itself. It is 
exclusive. Imagine you go for a maths test and the teacher asks you, one plus one equals, and you put three. And your teacher marks you wrong. And you go to your teacher and say, Sir, why are you so non inclusive? <laughs> why are you so dogmatic? I mean, one plus one, I'm sure, can also be sometimes one, maybe 1.5, maybe 2.32. But why be so exclusive? But you know what? The very nature of truth is inclusive. So the idea that there's no truth, no absolute truth is untenable in this world. We cannot live in this world like that. It was Dr. Ravi Zacharias who was speaking in Ohio State University. He was shown a very strange looking building because they were showing him you know, all the grounds of, of this university. And he came across this strange-looking building. It was called the Center of Arts. And Ravi said to his guide, what is this building all about? I look into it. There are staircases that go nowhere, pillars that serve no purposes, doors that open to nothing. The guy that was showing him had a glee in his face and said, sir, I want to show you that this is America's first post-mortem, uh, post-modern, not post-mortem. <laughs> Maybe sounds like it. <laughs> this is America's first post-modern building. The architect himself said, if life itself has no purpose, then why should our building have any design or purpose? <laughs> so he built it at random with no purpose. And Ravi has the wisdom of God and very gently he looked at this guy and he, and he said, Sir, I just have one question. Did the architect do that with the foundation of the building as well? If the foundation is done in random, that building will not stand. You see, postmodernism is the deception that comes from the devil. They remove all boundaries. You know why? Because we like to live that way. You know why? We like to satisfy the loss of our flesh. We rather go and hear somebody that would reinforce our prejudices so that we can do what we like rather than follow after the truth of God. So that's deception number one. Deception number one is the deception of postmodernism. Even if you don't recognize that word, that philosophy is permeating into every area. That's why it's changing the whole standard of morality. That's why there's no more morality. I'm going to spend a whole message on the fact that if there's no God, there's no basis for morality. Anything goes because we can do anything we like. Because who is to tell us what is right or wrong? If there is no God, then might is right. If everybody agreed this is right and wrong, it will be right. There will be no place for your own morality. But I'll leave it to the fourth message. But I want to deal with deception number two. Deception number one is postmodernism. Everything is relative. Nothing is absolute. But the second is often caused Christian to retreat back from public engagement in dialogue. And this deception is this. Science is based on facts, but biblical teachings are only based on faith. Many believe that science have made God redundant. Evolution is taught in school as a scientific fact. In fact, there's a movement called New Atheism that arises from this whole elevation of evolution as a complete completely established fact that we don't need God to see all that we are seeing today. It has made, science has made God unnecessary. I tell you, you talk to people, he says, why, are you, why don't you believe? I said, we don't do this. You know why? I'm a scientist. I, I believe in science and science uh, doesn't believe in faith. Science is based on fact. That's a lie from the devil. I have a whole message on the deception of Darwinism. 
I will show you that there's absolutely no strong scientific evidence for evolution at all. Everything it is, is a theory. And that theory has been shown more and more as science began to discover new things that it is wrong. It cannot be seen. You see, I want to tell you this. Evolution can never be proven. Why? In order to prove something scientifically, there must be two conditions. Let me use this illustration. In order to make a scientific experimentation and prove something as a scientific fact, number one, what you want to prove is observable. So, if I take this ball and I say, I want to prove that there's gravity. So what do you do? You do this. Ah, see? There's something that pulls it down. Yeah. <laughs> gravity sometimes takes hold of you too. <laughs> and not only that, not only is it observable, it's repeatable. I can repeat this with a, this ball. I can repeat this with this ball. And then I can repeat it in other different conditions. All right? In a very cold place, in a very hot place, in a very high place, in a very small place, in an enclosed place, in an open place. And I can repeat this and repeat this, and then I can observe this and I can observe this, and I find that after I've observed for a while, that theory is established and it becomes a law, a fact. The fact of the matter is, anything that has to do with origin can never be observed and therefore cannot be repeated. If there's a God, you can't ask God to, can you try again? Come to my laboratory tomorrow and recreate this whole thing and then can you keep doing it and then we'll establish it as a scientific fact? It's not possible. I showed the 144 in the 144 retreat, a, do, uh, a documentary in which a man went up to the streets to, uh, to a university and asked all the students and even professor and asked them, uh, can you, do you believe in science? They said, yes. Do you believe there's a God? No. Why? Because I believe in science. Do you believe in evolution? Yes. And then the question posed to them is this. Can you give one observable fact of a change between one species to another? Just one, just one. They say, oh, there are thousands of them. Never mind, just one. One. Uh, and you see these uh, professors and doctors of uh, biology just... Uh, uh, Ah, the finches. You know, finches on the island, the big, huh? when, the, when the weather begins to change, the big become, uh, from small become big. So that's not evolution, that's called adaptation. <laughs> right? I mean, we all have different summer. Uh, you stay in a hot country, maybe after centuries, your skin becomes dark because it protects you. That's adaptation. Have you ever given me one observable evidence that a species has changed? Right now? You want me to... Prove to you gravity, yeah, see? Right? You want to prove evolution? Okay, here's an amoeba. Show me how it becomes a monkey. I got a time, I'll wait. <laughs> and you know, all of them say, um, no, 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 no. Uh, that took place about 300 million years ago. 300 million years ago. My friend, that's not observable. In fact, I want to tell you this. You, this is beyond the scope of science. You understand that? So don't buy this thing about science is based on facts. Whenever science began to postulate answers for the origin, it's beyond science. For example, if somebody murdered somebody and is brought to the court, there's no way of proving that that murder took place. Scientifically. Understand? It's beyond science. You can't go and say, can you try again? <laughs> ah, yeah. What do you do? All you can do is look at evidence. Collect pieces of evidence that shows that it is most probable. And you make a verdict that this murder takes place. You can't prove it scientifically. So to say that science is based on fact when it says that you originated from an ape. That is not observable, not provable, it is a statement of faith. But that faith is not baseless. You look at evidence. And I want to submit to you in that whole message that the evidence that there is a designer. 
of the universe is so overwhelming that you must violate the normal logic of our living to accept it coming from nothing. In fact, I want to say this to you that this is a big uh, problem in the deception. Uh, DMS uh, Watson, professor of zoology and comparative anatomy at University, uh, University College, London said, evolution is accepted not because it has been observed, but because the alternative special creation is clearly incredible. I can give you quote after quote where scientists are told, as you study evolution, just remember one thing. The existence of God is not possible. So now go and find the answer. They exclude this because they say, I cannot accept the existence of God and this is the only other alternative. And that's why Darwinism is being accepted. So after Keith, famous Scottish anatomist and anthropologist stated, evolution is unproved and unprovable. We believe it because the only alternative is special creation and that is unthinkable. I want to tell you this. Both theism and atheism are based on faith. Don't let anybody fool you. They say this is based on science and science is based on fact. When science make a postulation of our origin, it cannot be based on fact. It's still based on faith. Not blind faith, but faith based on evidence. It is like we becoming a Christian. Finally, it's like standing at the edge of an airplane where you have learned how to skydive, but this is your first dive. And until you take the step, you don't know what skydiving is. You must take the step of faith. It's not buying faith. For a few months, you've been trained how to fold your parachute, how to activate your parachute, how to land safely. But the first time you get on a plane and the doors of the plane flings open and you look down and you say, Oh my God. And now you have to decide, do you take that first step? Until you take that first step, you know nothing really about skydiving. But it's not a blind step of faith. You've seen people doing it. So finally, you need to take that step of faith. You see, atheism or theism, they're all based on faith. But please understand that the issue being debated today is not between theism and atheism but between theism and naturalism. The opposite of theism is not atheism. The opposite of theism is naturalism. Theism believes that God is the first cause who has no beginning. He's the intelligent life source. Naturalism believes that in the beginning, there is just some substance, whatever it is some gases like oxygen or hydrogen or carbon, or some even believe the universe was there eternally. This was the first cause. In the beginning was the cosmos. I'm going to give you some quote of people who believe in that. They believe in that, that there was a beginning that has no beginning. You have to choose whether that beginning with no beginning is an intelligent God or is some kind of a cosmic goo of some mixture of chemical, and out of that, there you are today. You see, often people say, how can I believe in a God that has no beginning? The fact is, scientists make statements that believe that all these things started from something natural that has no beginning. We believe that in the beginning, there was an all-knowing, almighty God. The naturalist scientists believe that in the beginning, there was substance that has no beginning. You must understand that. That's why it takes faith to believe in naturalism or atheism. By the way, it takes as much faith to believe that there's no God. When someone comes to me and says, I don't believe there's God, I say, congratulations, you're a man of faith. <laughs> I know that the atheist takes great objection to that. In fact, there's already the humanistic society consisting of atheists and agnostics is reacting to this series of sermons. <laughs> In fact, in, 19, uh, in 2013, I had a straight time interview called The Supper Club on various things. And, they asked, and, uh, and the reporter asked me a question about atheism. And my answer was simply this. My answer was, 
that atheism is a religion. An atheist is a very religious person. This is my exact word. He has a belief system. He believes there's no God. It's not a scientific statement. He just believes there's no God. The president of humanistic, uh, humanistic uh, or humanist society then wrote a feedback. He says, you know, the prefix a in front of theism does not mean the opposite of or against. In other words, I'm not against theism. All right? It simply refers to the absence of theism. So atheism is not that there's no God. It's just the absence of theism. You know what the argument is? It says, it's not a belief system because we are a non-belief system. Atheism is just not a belief. It's a non-belief. So I don't have to show evidences. It's a non-belief. You know what I say? This is double talking. This is double talking. It's non-believing. Okay, I just... I have a non-belief that Po We Long exists. <laughs> no, I didn't say I didn't believe. It's a non-belief. I am just a Po We Long. <laughs> I'm not anti Po We Long. I'm a Po We Long. It's not a belief. So, because it's not a belief system, I don't want to show evidence. It's a non-belief system. Guys, beware lest people cheat you with empty philosophies and deceptive concepts. We see that all around us. In fact, I want to say this to you, that many of the things that the scientists do is based on faith. For example, the scientists believe that there is Order in the whole universe. That's the premise. Otherwise, why learn science? Everything random one. Can sometimes this, can sometimes this. Then you can't do experiment because maybe right now it's like that. Tomorrow is different. Why would scientists pursue after the truth of science? Is that they believe in this world there is order. Understand? That's why it makes it worthwhile to be a scientist. You want to discover the order. It's based on the faith of a premise. It's, that's, that's what it is all about. In fact, scientists don't know some very basic concept. It was Dr. John Nanox who had a, had a lecture in one of the prestigious scientific institutions in, in England. And in the, in the end of that, there was a question and answer time. A very renowned physicist uh, asked him a question. He said, Dr. Nanox, you are one of the you know, very renowned mathematician and philosopher of our age. How can you as a scientist believe that Jesus Christ is simultaneously a man and God. And Dr. Nanok said, I appreciate what you asked, I will respond to that, but before you do, let me ask you a simple question. Can you tell me what is consciousness? And the physicist says, I don't know. He said, okay, let me make it simpler. Can you ex tell me what is energy? And this physicist said, well, I can measure it. I know the formulas or the equation to kind of harness it. No, no, no. John said, I'm not asking you what you can do with it. I'm asking you, can you tell me what energy is? And this physicist looked at him and said, Professor John, you and I know, because we have read the same papers, scientists have no idea what energy is. Do you know that? Scientists have no idea what energy energies. They can measure it, they can harness it, they can use it, but they have no idea what energy is. And so John said, let me understand this. You are about to dismiss my whole faith in God because I do not fully understand how Jesus Christ can be man and God at the same time. He kind of grinned. He says, how do you feel like if I dismiss all your understanding of physics and science, when you can't even tell me what energy is, and energy is certainly much less complex than who God is. You see, it is in our arrogance that we feel like we know all things and that we say we don't need God anymore. I tell you, science is based on faith as much as religion is based on faith. 
By the way, the, the humanists actually uh, will react to that. Today, there's a newspaper, a whole, whole article on it. And in one of the article, this is the topic. Atheists deserve a place in interfaith dialogue. <laughs> I rest my case. <laughs> So what's the application? What's the application? The application is, church, learn to think biblically. Understand? First, learn to study the Bible, but learn to think biblically. Don't get bowled over by the scientists and say, this is science, this is fact. No! Much of this has no, nothing to do with facts. It's their alternate view, their own alternate biblical view. And that's it. So what does the Bible say? Please, don't let anyone cheat you. Romans 12, 2 says, Do not be conformed to this world, but be transformed by the renewing of your mind, that you may prove what is good and acceptable and perfect will of God. I like the New Living Translation that reads, Don't copy the behavior and custom of this world, but let God transform you into a new person by changing the way you think. Then you will learn to know God's will for you which is good and pleasing and perfect. The Apostle Paul says in 1 Corinthians 14, verse 20, Brothers, stop thinking like children. In regard to evil, be infants, but in your thinking, be adults. Church, we are not asked to commit intellectual suicide when we give our life to the Lord and to His truth. In fact, when we do, we are activated supernaturally to go beyond the limitation of man and enter into the mystery and the majestic presence of an all-knowing God who says, my ways are not your ways, my thinking are not your thinking, as high as the heaven is above the earth, so great is, are my ways above your ways. In fact, we enter into the great God who is all-knowing and we tap into the wisdom of God. Matthew 22 verse 37 says, Love the Lord your God with all your heart, with all your soul, and all your mind. Ask God to make you a biblically thinking person. Amen? There are three reasons why we must develop a biblical worldview. Number one, a biblical worldview declares God's truth. We must study the Word of God. Number two, a biblical worldview deposes The devil's deception, he exposes it and it destroys its power in our lives so that we truly are set free. So we must learn to be thinking Christians. But one final one. The biblical worldview determines our destiny so that we can live in freedom. I mentioned earlier that Dr. Ravi Zechariah says any worldview must answer four fundamental issues. Origin, meaning, morality, and destiny. In the remaining four messages, I'm going to show you that when we believe that we are made in the image of God, there is a God who is the ultimate wise God, who is the designer of everything. When we understand it, He gives the best explanation with the most evidence to show that we can find our origin, meaning, morality, and destiny. Destiny. And then he goes on to say, Dr. Zechariah say, to answer these four questions, the answers must pass the three tests. Number one, logical consistency. Number two, empirical adequacy. That means enough adequate evidences. And number three, experiential relevance. We must ask ourselves, what is the worldview that causes us to have a sense of purpose in our life that makes our life worth living? And I want to tell you this, a biblical worldview will show us what our destiny is. When we lay hold of a biblical worldview, we know that our life has meaning. And history brings about God's destiny. And of all persons who have the biblical worldview, who is able to live through the toughest time, is a man who knows the biblical worldview of God. And this man is Daniel. Daniel of the Old Testament, the prophet. Daniel lived and worked through two of the most powerful but evil empires of ancient history, the Babylonian and the Persian Empire. 
But because he has a world view that is grounded on the Word of God, on the revelation of God, he, it enables him to live through all this difficult time with a sense of destiny. The book of Daniel opened with a remarkable declaration. Daniel chapter 1 verse 2 says, In the third year of King Jehoiakim's reign in Judah, King Nebuchadnezzar of Babylon came to Jerusalem and besieged him. The Lord gave him victory over King Jehoiakim of Judah and permitted him to take some of the sacred object from the temple of God. Now, I want you to understand this. What happened to Daniel was perhaps the, one of the most painful times of his life. Jerusalem was destroyed. The temple was destroyed. His parents were probably killed. He was made a eunuch and deported to a foreign land to serve a wicked king. Everything was going wrong. But when he recorded all that has happened, he made this statement. He said, the Lord gave Nebuchadnezzar the king, Jehoiakim. The Lord permitted him to take some of the sacred object from the temple of God. Wow, that's theocentric worldview. He knows that even in the hardest time, God is on the throne. And that's why he lived successful in Babylon, became the prime minister, the second most powerful man of, of three emperors that was his boss because his view is that of prophet Isaiah in 46, chapter, uh, chapter 46, verses 9 to 11. Remember the things I've done in the past, for I alone am God. I am God, and there's none like me. Only I can tell you the future before it even happens. Everything I plan will come to pass, for I do whatever I wish. I will call a swift bird of prey from the east, a leader from a distant land, to come and do my bidding. I have said what I would do, and I I will do it. In other words, our worldview tells us that God is in control. God is sovereign. He's the one who fulfills His purposes and He's the one who carries out His plan. And in the right time, in the fullness of time, Galatians 4 verses 4 to 5 says, God sent His Son, born of a woman, subjected to the law. God sent Him to buy freedom for us who were slaves to the law so that He could adopt us as His own very children. You see, the worldview that believes that we are not an accident, that we are wonderfully made by, for a purpose by a God who is all-loving. History takes on meaning, and our destiny is certain. It was John Gray, the professor of history of European thought at the London School of Economics, who himself is an agnostic, so he's not a Christian, that does not believe in God or doesn't know anyone can know there's a God, understands this when he said, if you believe that humans are just like animals, there can be no such thing as a history of humanity. Only the lives of particular human. If we speak of history of the species at all, it is only to signify the unknowable sum of these lives. As with other animals, some lives, some lives are happy, some are wretched. None has meaning that lies beyond itself. What this amounts to is the importance of realizing that the real meaning of history lies outside history. The heart of monotheism is that God who is outside history is a guarantor of meaning. History is really His story. It is a story of God in the life of man. A biblical worldview sees the big picture of human history with a sense of destiny. This is called the meta-narrative. But the Pope modernists will reject that completely because they do not want to submit themselves to a God who is in control and who is sovereign. I hope you understand. I hope it is not beyond, but that's really fascinating. If we are all just like animals, we are all evolved. There's no history of humanity. Why right? It's just individual life doing its own thing. But when we know that there's a divine designer, history takes on meaning. In fact, our life takes on meaning when we have some, our own little history. That's why once in a while, I like to take out my old album photo album and look at it. 
So I took out this album, and sometimes I want to show it to my children because my children need to know history and remember who Lao Pa and Lao Ma is. So we took out these pictures. <laughs> Isn't that a picture of a submissive husband? <laughs> that was 39 years ago. I married my sweetheart. Next picture. Isn't that, isn't she pretty? <laughs> and then out of it, although we have four children, one was adopted, we have three naturally born children. Remind them. Priscilla, Michelle, and Daniel. Here's another picture. You can tell we feed them really well. <laughs> and now I want to show you a picture of our deputy senior pastor. But we have history. We have history when we look at our own photo album. But I want to show you right now God's photo album. Watch this. God created man in his own image. the tree of knowledge of good and evil, you shall not eat. The Lord said to the serpent, I will put enmity between your offspring and hers. He shall bruise your head, and you shall bruise his head. Now the earth was corrupt in God's sight, and the earth was filled with violence. And the Lord said to Noah, Go into the ark, you and your household. Rain fell upon the earth forty days and forty nights. And God said to Noah, Behold, I establish my covenant with you. The Lord said to Abram, Go from your country to the land I will show you. And Abraham took the ram instead of his son, and offered it up as a burnt offering. And Pharaoh said to Joseph, See, I have sent you over the land of Egypt. When the child grew up, he became her son, and she named him Moses. Go into Pharaoh and say, Thus says the Lord, let my people go. And the Lord went before them by day in a pillar of cloud. Then Moses stretched out his hand over the sea, and the Lord drove the sea back by a strong east wind. You shall have no other gods before me. And David had success in all he did, for the Lord was with him. I will establish the throne of his kingdom forever. I intend to build a house for the name of the Lord my God. As the Lord said to David my he father, He took into Babylon those who had escaped the sword. So Judah was taken into exile. The virgin shall conceive and bear a son, and shall call his name Emmanuel. The righteous one, my servant, shall make many to be accounted righteous, and shall bear their iniquities. And she gave birth to her firstborn son, and laid him in a manger. Wise men from the east came to Jerusalem, saying, Where is he who has been born king of the Jews? From that time Jesus began to preach, saying, Repent, for the kingdom of heaven is at hand. And he healed many who were sick with various diseases, and cast out many demons. Jesus began to show his disciples that he must go to Jerusalem and suffer many things. of all nations, baptizing them in the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit. While he blessed them, he parted from them, and was carried up into heaven. And divided tongues of fire appeared to them, and rested on each one of them, and they were all filled with the Holy Spirit. So those who received his word were baptized, and there were added that day about three thousand souls. And falling to the ground, he heard a voice saying, Saul, Saul, why are you persecuting me? For I am not ashamed of the gospel, for it is the power of God for salvation to everyone who believes, to the Jew first, and also to the Greek. I looked, and there before me was a great multitude that no one could count, from every nation, tribe, people, and language. Surely I am coming soon. The grace of the Lord Jesus be with all.
God wants to put all of us in His photo album. We need to develop a biblical worldview because it declares God's truth. It deposes the devil's deception that robs us of all the blessings of God. But most of all, it determines our destiny because we know that we are part of this God's photo album. Psalm 33 verse 11 says, But the plans of the Lord stand firm forever, the purposes of His heart through all generations. Jeremiah 29 verses 11 to 13 say, For I know the plans I have for you, says the Lord. They are plans for good and not for disaster, to give you a future and a hope. In those days when you pray, I will listen. If you look for me wholeheartedly, you will find me. Isaiah chapter 1 verse 18 says, Come now, let us reason together. Though your sins are like scarlet, they shall be as white as snow. Though they be red as crimson, they shall be as wool. Psalm 34 verse 8 says, Oh, taste and see that the Lord is good. Blessed is the man who trusts in Him. The Lord invites us to experience Him as the ultimate understanding of the truth that He has designed us with a purpose. The Lord says, come and reason together. Your sins will be forgiven because I've come to die for your sin. I took your place on the cross. The Word of God says, God made Him who knew no sin to become sin on our behalf that we may have His righteousness. God today wants you, want to invite you to enter into the reality of His truth and His presence so that you will be set free from the lies of the devil that give you a sense of purposelessness and meaninglessness. The Bible says, Jesus said, I come to seek and to save those who are lost. You know, He didn't say that all of us are terribly wicked people, we are murderers. There are those who are, but most of us are not. But the Bible says we are lost. We don't know where we come from. We don't know where we are going. But today the Lord says, He comes and seek and to save those who know you're lost and there are some of you who are lost you're lost as to what you should do next in view of the struggles in your marriage you're lost as to do with what do you do next in view of the problems in the marketplace you're not sure because you feel like you have too many things you do not understand but the Lord says I want you to come I want to set you free because my truth will set you free the word of God says Whosoever receive me, as many as receive him, to them give the authority to be the sons of God, even to those who believe on his name. Today, God wants to invite you to be part of his photo album, part of his people that live this world in the midst of all the mess with a sense of dignity and a sense of destiny. You may say, Pastor Kong, how do I receive Jesus Christ today? and have my sins forgiven. Well, I cannot do it on your behalf, but I can help you along. In a moment, in this sacred moment, I'm going to lead you in a word of prayer. I will say one line, and if you are led by the Spirit, I want you to repeat after me aloud. This prayer is designed for those who have never invited Jesus Christ in a person that way. You may have gone to church, you might have you know, been associated with some organization that are religious, but you've never personally invited Jesus Christ to render your life to Him and say, come into my life and be my Lord, be my Master, be my Savior. This prayer is designed to help you to do that. But you must say it after me aloud because the Bible says if you confess with your mouth, there's something that happens when you speak it out and believe in your heart that Jesus is the Lord of your life, you will be saved. 
And I'm going to lead you because I know there are a number of you who are here by divine appointment. You think your friend brought you and kind of nagged you to come, but I want you to know that it's by divine appointment you are here today. The message I preach today, I've never preached ever in my 40 year of ministry, but I just sense that there's so much deception out there. We need to speak about the truth of God in terms of a worldview that permeates into our life. And God invites you to join His photo album. And if you are ready, I'm going to lead you in a prayer. Will you repeat after me? And when the people who are new do this for the first time, I want every Christian to join in so that they feel like they are part of a whole community of people that walks with you, walks with God into God's destiny for each of our lives. So I invite all of you right now in this sacred moment, bow your head, close your eyes. No one moving around, please. This is a sacred moment. Even if you're new here, just do it. I'll respect for this moment. And I know that there are a number of you where God has spoken to. Maybe something that was said that jolted you to see things in a different way. Maybe there's just a longing in your heart to know God. And finally, whether you're a scientist or you're a religious person, you have to take that step of faith. You either choose that this world came from just natural thing and everything else happened or it came from a cleverly designed master that made this happen. And God says, you are wonderfully made. So today, you're going to give your life to Jesus. And if you want to do that, I'm going to lead you in that prayer right now. I say one line, you repeat after me and all the Christians join in. I'm going to pray right now. Say with me, please. If you have never said this prayer, say with me right now. Say, Dear Father in heaven. Dear Father in heaven. Say with conviction, Dear Father in heaven. Dear Father in heaven. Thank you that you are the truth. Thank you that you are the truth. Thank you for sending Jesus Christ. Thank you for sending Jesus Christ. To show us your grace. To show us your grace. When he died for my sin. When he died for my sin. On the cross of Calvary. On the cross of Calvary. Today. Today, I want to open my heart. I want to open my heart to receive this grace. To receive this grace. To invite Jesus Christ. To invite Jesus Christ into my life. Into my life, dear Lord Jesus. Dear Lord Jesus, please come into my life. Please come into my life. Forgive my sins. Forgive my sins. Cleanse my heart. Cleanse my heart. Make me a child of God. Make me a child of God. From today onwards. From today onwards. I want to walk in your truth. I want to walk in your truth. And fulfill the destiny. And fulfill the destiny. That you have created me for. That you have created me for. Help me, Lord. Help me, Lord. All the days of my life. All the days of my life. To follow you. To follow you. Obey you. Obey you. And love you. And love you. Forever and ever. Forever and ever. Thank you, Lord Jesus. Thank, Thank you, Lord, Lord Jesus. Jesus. I want every head bow and every eye closed. I am certain that it is somebody you who prayed that prayer. If you prayed that prayer with earnest, earnestness of your heart, don't worry about whether your faith is enough or not because it doesn't matter how big or small your faith is. What really matters is how big the God on whom you put your faith. And God is a true God. If you pray that prayer, God has answered your prayer. Your sins are forgiven. I want to pray for you. I want to publicly declare on behalf of God's Word that your sins are forgiven and you are now a child of God. I want to know who you are. This is what I'm going to do. Every head bow, every eye closed. No one looking around except those who are on duty. I'm going to count to three. I'm going to count one, two, and three. On the count of three, if you pray that prayer with me or you pray it in your heart, with me, meaning in your heart. At the count of three, I want you to immediately raise your hand and don't put it down. You don't need to lift up your head. Do not need to open up your eyes. Keep your head bowed. Keep your eyes closed. But raise your hand and don't put it down. And by raising your hand, you're saying, Pastor Kong, earnestly, I was touched by the Lord and I prayed that prayer to give my life to the Lord. I want to fulfill God's destiny. I want to be in God's photo album. And you keep your hands up and I want to pray a prayer and declare that the truth of God come into your life. And from this day onwards, you're going to walk in the truth and the truth will set you free. I'm going to count right now whether you're in Suntec City or right here because I can see you through the monitor. At the count of three, if you pray that prayer, immediately raise your hand and don't put it down. I'm going to count right now. One, two, 
three, raise your hand right now. Just raise it up high. Raise it up high. Yes, don't, don't put it up. Raise it up high. Say, God, today I want to give my life. Right now, right now. Just hold it up. Your hands are not tired so quickly. I want to give an opportunity. Is there someone else? Do not hesitate. Do not say that my life is in a mess. Let me get it in order. You can't. If you can, you don't need God. Keep your hands up. Yes, I see you. I see you also in, in, in Suntag. Praise God. I'm going to pray right now. Is there someone else? Yes, I'm going to pray. Lord, you see these hands. They represent hearts that have been opened to you. Now, in the name of Jesus by the authority of God's Word, I declare that on the basis that you have surrendered your life to the Lord, this day, the blood of Jesus cleanses you from all the sin. In the past, and the Lord says to you, you are set free by the truth of God. And you are set free to fulfill the purposes of God in your life. And this is the beginning of a life walking with God. May the Lord keep you and bless you in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. Can we all stand up? Can we all stand up and give God a round of applause? Come on, let's thank the Lord. Listen, there, are, there were a number. Listen to me, there were a number. Come on, give God a big round of applause for us. Come on, He deserves it. Woo! Thank you, Lord. Thank you, Lord. There were a number of you that raised your hand. And I know that in a place like that, there are some who actually pray, but maybe you feel awkward, you didn't raise your hand. But this is what I want to do. On a count of three, I want all those who raise your hand to take your belongings. I'm going to count to three. I want you to leave your seat and come forward. Those friends that brought you, they'll be happy to accompany you. You know why? Because I want the whole church to pray a blessing for you. Because now you belong to the family of God. And some of you did not raise your hand. But you know you want to give your life to Jesus. I want you to come. If you brought a friend who doesn't know Christ, don't be pushy, but ask. If you are ready to come forward, I'll be happy to accompany you. Maybe it's always good to encourage somebody to take a step towards God. So when I come to three, we're going to welcome you and you're immediately going to come forward. We're going to pray for you. Are you ready? Suntec City also. Ready? One, two, three. Come on, let's welcome them. Come forward. This is the day of salvation. This is the appointed time. This is the day where we connect with our Creator. Where we reject the lies of the devil. They want to rob us of the blessings of God. You come right now. We're waiting. You come. And in Suntag, a number of you, you come forward. Right now, right now. Come forward. Come forward. Praise God. Don't, don't feel embarrassed. Come. I saw a number of hands here. Don't feel embarrassed, just come forward. This is the day of salvation. Praise God. You come. You come. You come. We're going to pray for you. We're going to declare that this is the day of victory. We're going to set you free so that you know the truth of God. We want you to know that you have a family that cares for you. And that God is alive in your heart. Praise God. Praise God. Welcome, my friend. Welcome, my friend. Come. What a wonderful day. What a wonderful day. Come forward. Just come take a step forward because there are others who are coming. And I see the people in Suntec City. Let me say this to you. This is the most important days of your life. The Bible says, If any man be in Christ, is a new creation. All things have passed away. Behold, all things become new. But the Bible says you are born again in the family of God. That means you are a spiritual infant. It doesn't matter how old or how young you are. You're a little baby in the Lord. A little baby needs to be cared for. You leave a baby alone, there will be trouble. A little baby needs a family. Today, we are your family. Give us a chance to help you to grow in the truth of God so that you can harness all the blessings that comes with God's truth. Ask the right questions. Ask real questions. And ask God for an answer. It's an exciting journey. We haven't done everything yet. But we walk in His ways. So that's why we brought you forward. We want the church to pray for you. And after that, uh, there's a pastor who is going to lead you outside. And we want to just take down your particulars, give you some material to help you on this journey. Give us a chance to walk with you. 
so that you can experience the fullness of the blessing of God's truth. So church, those in Suntec City as well, God bless you. God is going to bless you all the days of your life. He will never leave you or forsake you because He loves you. Can we all raise our hand and pray a blessing for them? Say it together with me. In the name of Jesus, we welcome you into the family of God. We declare that God's blessing will be upon you in your marriage, in your career, in your health, in every aspect of your life from this day onwards and forevermore. In Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. Can you welcome them? Can you please turn around and just uh, follow the pastor there? We just want to give you some material outside. Thank you. Thank you for your indulgence. Praise God. Praise God. Come on, let's welcome them. Lift up your hands. I want to pray a blessing for you. May the Lord bless you with the understanding of His truth right here and there in Suntex City. May the Lord show you how to walk in His truth in every area of your life so that the truth of God will set you free. In Jesus' name, amen. God bless you and see you next week.